Good morning. This is uh, Pastor George Mims of the Church of the Living God uh, here in Pittsburgh, California. We are so grateful uh, for each and every one of you all for joining us in our third live stream this week. Um, let's, before we go into the word, I'd like to have a word of prayer. Uh, just, so just bow your heads with me wherever you are. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity in this moment uh, just to be in your presence. Lord, we just stand, behold your majesty and your awesomeness in all that you are and all that you do. God, we put our full confidence in you. and We thank you for all the blessings that you bestowed upon us. I just pray right now that you continue to uh, open the hearts and minds of those uh, that are listening today that are on our live stream. Um, I pray, God, that you bridle my tongue and my heart that I may speak only your words, only those things that are pleasing in your sight. Um, I desire to to do your bidding today, to proclaim your good news and not my own. And so right now, help me to minimize as you maximize that you might be glorified, that you might be lifted. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen, amen, amen. We thank you, thank you, thank you. This is such an incredible opportunity. Um, and again, as you uh, uh, tune into our live stream, you'll see improvements and changes uh, from week to week. And so we're actually tooling it up. And uh, though COVID is, you know, sort of the impetus behind a lot of discomfort and disruption, uh, we thank God that uh, we see his fingerprints in the presence of our pandemic, that the gospel will not be apprehended, that encouragement, that, um, you know, life that is intended for those that Jesus is calling uh, shall not stop. It shall continue to move forward. And so we thank you um, again for uh, such an incredible opportunity to be with you today. Um, I, I want to take some time to do a little bit of teaching today. I feel like I just, God is laying some things on my heart that I think it's really important for us to be able to understand. Uh, for those that are listening, those that are tuning in, I pray that your hearts might be encouraged uh, today. And so the thing that I want to ask you um, is what do you do when, when things uh, seem to be bad or life-altering things happen? Are, do you consider them bad or do you consider them good? Uh, when, 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 when the furnace goes out or the transmission is not working, is that something bad or is that something good? And how does God see those circumstances? How does he see the situation? I remember uh, years ago, my wife and I, we attended a church and um, among the membership in the congregation, we had a prominent uh, you know, state politician that attended the church. And uh, one Sunday morning, he was standing at the top of the stairs, putting on his socks, and he ended up losing his balance and falling down the stairs and injuring himself to the point where he needed to go to the hospital. Upon examination at the hospital for an ankle or leg injury, they found a spot on his liver. Was that situation good or was it bad? In 1964, the Assemblies of God um, sent a missionary by the name of J.W. Tucker into the Republic of Congo to be able to take the gospel, to be able to preach on the other side of the world. And he did that. But you see, J.W. Tucker was also murdered during that, that time where he was doing missionary work. And they threw his body in the neighboring river that, that you know, was filled with crocodiles. That river happened to go through the Mangbeto tribe, um, a tribe that was a local tribe there, that was a prominent tribe. Um, and so it seemed like his work was in, in, in vain. You know, he went there only to be murdered and thrown uh, to be eaten by the crocodiles. 30 years later, however, uh, that tribe that the river ran through, the Mengbeto tribe, uh, got into a really heated civil war, a really bad situation. And the king of the Mengbeto tribe reached out to the neighboring Kinshasa to ask them to send somebody, a neutral party, to help them to sort of reconcile the situation. So they sent one of their highest esteem uh, brigadier policemen to come in and to try to talk to both sides, but he was unsuccessful after several months of trying to reconcile the situation. It wasn't until one day he heard the story of a Mangbeto tradition that if the blood of any man runs through that river, that neighboring river that ran through the village, then the people must listen to the story of the man whose blood it is that's running in the river. And so when he heard that, he convinced the king and the warring fashions factions to come together to, to hear the story of, a, of a, 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 a one that came, J.W. Tucker, a missionary, 30 years ago, bringing the message of Jesus Christ, talking about a redeemer of mankind that would 
would save people from being uh, consumed by the flesh, being controlled by the flesh, that would b basically solidify eternal salvation in his own blood. And, and, and here, here's how the story goes, is that that tribe was changed from that day forward. It was transformed. To this very day, there are thousands of Christians that have come out of the Mangbeto tribe in that entire region because of the missionary work of J.W. Tucker. There are hundreds of Assemblies of God churches in that area. And so the question that I ask is, the death of J.W. Tucker, was it good or was it bad? The thing about it is that we oftentimes make those determinations. We look and we, we judge God and we, we get angry at him sometimes because the situation seems to be bad. It doesn't seem to be in our favor. There's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, and it's not the deep, profound verse, but it, you know, that talks about the greatness of God. It's the one that reminds me of my own frailty, that reminds me of my own clouded vision. It's Proverbs chapter 21 and 2, and it says this. It says that, Everything in a man's own eyes, he determines to be good, but it's God who weighs and tries the heart. I, I love it because it reminds me that even on our best days, when we think our vision is crystal clear, that we understand the hand of God, that we receive his words, and we, 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 we know definitively where God is taking us, it reminds us that even in those moments, we must commit our hearts to the Lord to allow him to judge the intent, to allow him to be able to see that we were deceiving ourselves. You see, the thing that I want to impress upon you today that are listening is that in order to see the good in the bad, we must see Christ in the middle. Let me say that again. In order to see good in the bad. You see, if all power were in heaven and earth, when Jesus got up out of the grave on the other side of, 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 of you know, death, and he, the Bible says that he had all power, then if he has all power, then it, it seems like that power would include the things that impact our lives. And here's the thing, the scriptures are true, they tell us that. But you and I must, must think about what does that really mean for our lives, that even when things seem to be bad, even when it doesn't seem to be going our ways, that somehow that is working together for our good. So should we get really bent out of shape over the situation? That scripture reminds me that even when I think that I have just a clear line of sight, on the clearest of all days that my, my, my judgment, my vision, my interpretation can be clouded by something that's hidden in my heart. I remember a time uh, years ago when I was in corporate America and I had a, a manager, a supervisor, and it, it had a bad supervisor. At least that's how I determined or assessed him at that time. And I remember at the end of a performance year that I, I, I did what I thought was a bang up job. I, I, I did exceptionally well, but my manager, that, that manager that I thought was a bad manager, thought I could have done better. And we kind of had a, a difference of opinions that didn't really end up well. But I, but I remember going into successive jobs and moving on, but there seemed to be residue of that, 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 that same sort of experience that was germinating in my heart and clouding my vision, and, and it was a distraction. And I, and I remember just being angry at the manager, at the supervisor, that seemed to be the start of this cascade of events. You see, the thing about it is that I'm, I'm, I'm years past that. I've gotten over it. Um, all the toxins have not cleared my system, you know, so to speak. I still think about that, and I still remember how I felt um, and what was going through my mind. But the reality of it is that, you know, it's kind of like Paul when he talks about uh, to the Thessalon Thess uh, Thessalonian church. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18 says, give thanks in all situations. I'm learning to give thanks in all situations. So I haven't quite gotten there yet, but, but every day I, I, I sort of press towards, you know, this, this idea of who Christ is calling me to be. It, do you find that, that story similar to things that you might be contending with? Have you found yourself in situations where there seems to be more turbulence than there is tailwind? You're, you're looking, you, you might be in a situation right now where, where you see more clouds than you do silver linings. The question that I have for you is that how do you assess what's, what's good and what's bad? I submit to you is that the, the, the reality of it is that the only way for us to see the good in our situation, to see the good and the bad, is for us to see Christ in the middle. Some of you that are listening today, you're in a storm right now, and all you can think about is that this storm has been persisting for years and years and years. But here's the question that I ask, and that is that if, if, if Jesus has gotten up with all power in heaven and in earth, 
If, if, if the Bible says that the, the heart of the king is in the Lord's hands to ebb and flow as he chooses, then what is it that's stirring our spirit if God is in total control and he's promised never to leave us nor forsake us? He's promised never to make us part of the pavement or part of a, a, a sort of the steamroller, but to be uh, stories, to be epistles that people can see God's story written across us. Are we, some people go through situations and, and they come out more bitter on the other side than they did before they even went in. They, they, I, I submit to you that, you know, if that's your story, you're probably carrying things that God said you were never meant to carry. You're carrying the residue of something that God said, I freed you from that. I've, I've redeemed you. I've, 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 I've taken care of this. I've gone before you to establish your pathways, but yet you're carrying something that you need to offload today. You need to get that out. You see, in order for you to be able to see the good within the bad, within the inconvenience, within the situation, you must see Christ in the middle. Christ must be a necessity, not an option. Far too many people within the body of Christ, within churches, we, 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 we approach Jesus when things go bad or when we really think we need him. But when we have blue skies and there's no clouds or no turbulence in our lives, Jesus becomes an afterthought. He, he's kind of riding in the back of the trunk or next to the spare tire. That's not what God intends for us. He intends for us to, to seek him every day. It's like he told Israel when they were coming out of Egypt, in order for you to inhabit the promises that he commissioned in his own power and his own will, you must put the word before you. You must wake up with it and go down with it. Put it on your doorpost and lintel. Put it everywhere so that you can always be reminded that, that God is there with you, that you and I are reflections of his glory, reflections of his grace, or reflections of his mercy. I'm grateful that the scriptures, they, they, they give us an opportunity to be reminded of those things. And so let, let, let's go into the word today. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can read the scripture here. The scripture this morning is going to be coming from the book of Philippians. We're going to read two verses. Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 and 13 says this. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone that my imprisonment is for Christ. That my imprisonment is for Christ. You see, this letter in the book of Philippians is considered one of the prison epistles or the, the one, of the, one of the four times that Paul was in prison where he writes these books. Philippians uh, was written by the apostle Paul during his last of the four imprisonments. And he's writing this, this book not to, to deal with a situation that's going on in the church. It's written to the saints that are there at Philippi, but he's not addressing anything that has gone awry, but he's, he's almost kind of expressing just kind of joy. You see, the Apostle Paul at this point, he's at the end of his journey. This is the third missionary journey that he writes this, this prison epistle. He writes the book of Philippians. And so he's gone through tremendous pain and tremendous suffering and also tremendous joy. As Paul is writing this, keep in mind that he's already gone through the places where, where he, he's probably feeling extreme guilt of, of, of the persecution of the church that he brought about. You see, it was Paul, the Bible says in, in, in the book of Acts, that he was holding the coats of those that stoned Stephen, our first martyr that we see in church written in scripture. I, I can imagine the apostle Paul, when he's writing this, He's probably looking at the bruises on his arms and, and thinking about the scars on his face from the, from the beatdown that he took in, in Lystra when he was on his first missionary journey and he went to the towns preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. But you see, he came into conflict. He came to, to, to some folks that were willing to put their hands on him. And the Bible says that they stoned Paul and drug him outside of the city and left him for dead. Imagine that. He took a severe thrashing to the point where the people thought that he was dead as dead. But yet the Bible says when he was drug outside of the city, he came to and continued on the mission that he originally started. But I can imagine as Paul is writing this, he's also thinking about the tremendous power of God, thinking about the encounter that he had with Jesus himself on the road to Damascus, changing him, showing tremendous grace and not necessarily taking him out of the game, but giving him a second chance, a third chance to, to live for Christ. 
It was also, I'm sure Paul could remember that the, the, the power, the absolute power that God showed. We see in Acts chapter 16 when Paul and Silas were locked up in jail. And the Bible says they began to praise and, and God sent an earthquake so much that the doors were, were, were unshackled, that the chains fell off and, and the hinges and things were, were, were broken apart. That people that were in prison were set free because of what God did. And you see, it was because of that freedom that the jailer and all of those in his household come to, came to know Christ. So I imagine the Apostle Paul, he's got some things that he feels regretful about, some things that he sees that there's been, been, been some bad times and times where he took physical beatings for the sake of Christ. And there are times where God has shown his power. But yet we see the Apostle Paul talk with, with joy. And he says that I want you to know, and he's, he's writing to those that have sent help to him, knowing that he's in prison here at, at Philippi. He's in prison, I'm sorry, in Rome. And, 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 and so he, he's saying that, you know what, somehow this bad situation is working for the good. He's determined that in this bad, there's good. But the only way that the Apostle Paul can see this is that he sees that Christ is in the middle, that somehow God has allowed this, but, but, but for God's glory and not his own. When we look at the, the, the book of, of, of Philippians, we see those, those scriptures that we hear people quoting and that, you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. And, and, and it sounds good saying it, but here we're reading the words of one that has lived it and he feels it in his core. And so that Philippians 4 and 13, I can do all things. It can't be just something that we read. It must be something that we embody, something that we trust God in. Even when we can't see the storm clouds breaking, when we look at this thing, there are a couple of observations that I just want to leave with you. And I think that God has left these remnants of understanding so that you and I can live a victorious life. Not that we're going to live in financial abundance, but that we live and get to a place like the Apostle Paul, where he says, I've learned to be content in whatever situation I am, whether a base or whether a bound, whether I'm in the valley or whether I'm in the pit, I've learned to be a, a complete is that what that contentment means? It means to be filled. It means to be uh, not, not have any want or lack. We can get in that place in this life to where we recognize that our gaps and our deficiencies are just enough space for God to fill himself with. Just enough room for you and I to, to not uh, uh, sort of be tepid in approaching situations for fear of what can happen. So the Apostle Paul, as he's writing these things, he says this with great joy, but the thing, there are two things that I want to bring to your attention. And that is one, that the joy or the determination or the good seems to be for the benefit of others. I know it seems very obvious, but, but when you really think about that, a lot of the things that you and I sort of find good or bad are really kind of dependent upon how it affects us personally. L less to do about our calling, less to do about our vision and the things that God has called us to. Sometimes we get bent out of shape. We'll, we'll, we'll put on the gas face and we'll just be upset and just, just ugly angry because of what somebody may be doing to us or a situation that may have happened to us. But when we look at the, 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 the life of the Apostle Paul, he's not some avenger. No, he is one that has made Jesus Christ his personal savior. He is one that said that for you, I will live and for, for you, I'll die. It is the same message that God is calling us to do, and that is to make him first. But you see, Paul makes a determination of what's good by, by what's, what's good in the eyes of the Lord. What is the lesson for you and I in that one? That, that one is just, I, I think, is just powerful, is that he makes that determination to say, you know what, if it's good for others, then that's good for me. I'm excited about that. You see, he was in the purpose that God had called him to. And here's the second thing, and it might be obvious, but, but, but here it is, and that is that his strength was not in his own might and wisdom. Paul says that, that I, I was the chief of Pharisees, but he also says that I was a, a, a chief uh, a, a sinner. He, he talks very plainly in his writings about the fact that, that he counts everything as dung, all of his accomplishments and accolades, that it pales in comparison to the great mission and the great work that Jesus Christ has called him to. How do you look at your accomplishments? What do you put your confidence in? Do you put them in all the things that you may have done in the past? I know it, it feels good when, we, when, when those things happen to us or we get accolades or recognitions from man. But you see, those are not the things that are favorable in the eyes of God. 
I'm not saying that you should go into a depressed state about, no, I'm just going to, you know, uh, put this false altruism and kind of this false piety that, no, none of that means nothing. But, but in our core, do we really feel like Jesus Christ is our sustenance? He's, he's our, our power. If we, got, if we got him, we got everything. Do we really feel that? You see, we read someone who, who said that, you know what, recognizing that in my bad days, the power of Christ rests upon me. You remember the story of Paul? The Bible says he had a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what that was, but we know that God said no three times. But he said, my power and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul says, hey, knowing that, bring it on. So my weakness can be exploited because when it's exploited, I know that the power of God will show up. Do you and I have that, that, that same idea, that, that same desire to be pleasing to God? But, but even greater than that, is, is there some freedom and some, some rejoicing and praise that we're leaving on the table because all we can see is just things are just bad? I submit to you is that it's not in our human strength. It's not in our human understanding. It is in our total submission to God to say, God, if you would just come into my life, if you would take over and take control of all the things that I've been carrying, and I've been carrying them unsuccessfully, I've been expressing just discontentment and anger over situations, and I need you, God, to come in and to help me with that. The, Lo the Lord says that he will come in. The, the, the day that you hear my voice is what it says, harden not your heart. He says that, that if you open your table and, and allow Jesus to come down and to sit with you and to sup with you, if, you know, you'll be able to sup with him as he sups with you. What is the source of your strength? What, 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 where are you today? What, what are the things that, that you feel like are, are so burdensome, that are so big, that, that you can't wake up and find the joy that God has put in the situation? What are those things that steal your rest, that, that steal your, 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 your excitement about today or tomorrow or, or seeing family? Are there situations that you find yourself consistently complaining about? You may not audibly say any things, but, 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 but you may have a sad countenance. There may, may be something where people see you and just like, what are they upset about? What is he upset about? What is she upset about? Sometimes we, it, it stems from the inside. It stems from the things that are going on on the inside. And it's the place where the Lord says, I want to have full domain. I want to have full reign. Have you considered the possibility that, that God has put some good in some of the difficult things that are happening in your life? One of the most transformative things that, that happened for our family, and I know my, my kids get tired of me talking about it, but of, of all of our three kids, we've been in the ICU for all three of them, one with a diagnosis of type 1 diabetes with an elevated glucose level of 700, but yet he was able to walk in the doors under his own power. And then I had two other children years later that, that, that had gone through open heart surgery within two years apart from one another. And so thinking about that, as we were going through, we were just kind of in a fog, but, but we never kind of got down on ourselves. We never got angry with God, but we did ask God, God, help us to see what it is that you're doing in this. And, and God has shown us great and mighty things as a result of, of, of us asking him. He's allowed us to see the good inside of the bad. And, and so I, I, I say to you, what, what would your day, what would your moments, what would the rest of your life look like if you were willing to, to give God total control and total access in your life? I'm speaking to somebody today. I don't know who it is, but, but, but I know when I talk to people and I, and, I, and I receive messages, sometimes people get more down on themselves than, the, than, than others that are saying bad things about them or trying to press upon them. That old, the cliche that we had, that old nursery rhyme or jingle, you know, sticks and stones may, may break my bones, but names shall never hurt me. You see, I, I submit that that's probably something that sounded good and it made us feel good as kids. But now as an adult, I realize names do hurt, but it's not the names that other people call us, it's what we call ourselves. Are, are you caring and defining yourself in a different way that God has defined you? You see, in order to see the good inside of the bad, you must see Christ in the middle. Christ must not be optional. It's mandatory that he be a permanent fixture, that he be the center of your life. 
I want to challenge you for the next two weeks. And then we're at the end of the message, but I want to extend this challenge. I don't want to be just a reader of the word. I want to be a doer. I don't want to just kind of get excited for a moment uh, over the scriptures and the truth that God gives us and then go and turn around and now all of a sudden be thrown off or now I'm, I'm, I'm angry about a situation that, that, that God is in total control of. I don't want to be in that place. I don't, I don't want to be in that place to where I'm vacillated. One day I'm hot, one day I'm cold. So I want to challenge you to consider for uh, just a moment, for the next two weeks, every situation that you encounter, the things that you come up against. And if you find yourself in the next two weeks, you find a situation that you feel like is just, th this is just bad. I challenge you to seek to find the good, seek to see the good in the thing that God has intended for you. Let me offer a word of prayer for the word. Bow your heads with me. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity and this moment. We thank you for uh, this precious time to be able to share your word. God, I pray that, um, again, that you continue to guard our hearts and our minds um, against the things that uh, sometimes we, 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 we get down on ourselves. Lord, we know that you are in total control, and we just humble ourselves before you and ask that you go before us. Help us to glorify you in all things. Help us to lift you up. Help us to be an encouragement to those around you. God, I just ask that you help us to see your vision for our lives and give us, give us that boldness and courage to be able to go forth and to share your good news. If we have sinned or come against you, if we've offended you in any way, I just pray and just ask God, just, just please settle our hearts and, and we ask you for forgiveness. Give us another opportunity and allow your grace to cover us that we might be pleasing in your sight. Lord, we ask these blessings in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 I thank all of you all for joining us today. Um, if your heart has been blessed, um, if the, you, you want to hear this message again, if you want to hear some of the other messages of encouragement that the Lord has laid on my heart to be able to share with you, I just encourage you to go to our website. It's cotlg21pittsburgh.com. So that's cotlg, Church of the Living God, the number 21 in Pittsburgh, P-I-T-T-S-B-U-R-G dot com. There you can find access to the live streams. Uh, feel free to join some of our incredible virtual Bible studies that are taking place. We have some phenomenal teachers, phenomenal teachers that are, are breaking down the word in bite-sized chunks for anybody to be able to understand. And there's a great deal of encouragement that's there. And so I encourage you to come along and join us on our website. You'll also uh, find a place to be able to give. If the Lord has put on your heart to be able to contribute uh, to the ministry, to be able to sow a seed, you can go and do that on our website. Or if you say, you know what, I want to give now, you can text your giving in. Uh, the phone number is 73256. Again, that's 73256. Um, and then in the message section, uh, type in C-O-T-L-G 21. C-O-T-L-G 21 hit send, and then you'll receive a message back to help you to complete your giving. God bless you. God keep you. We're grateful for today for this moment's opportunity, and I look forward to seeing you again in the service. God bless. Enjoy. <laughs>